and I would like to invite Deborah Sunderman up. Good morning. Welcome to this sacred space. This is a sacred space, not just because it is where we gather for Sunday services, fellowships, weddings, celebrations and memorials in times of joy and sorrow. It is sacred because we worked together to build a church to house us and to provide a beacon of hope to those who come after us. And it is sacred because it is where we have planted trees in the soil and built memorials to honor our loved ones. This particular place is our sacred space. For better or worse, our church property speaks volumes about who we are and who we want to be. If you have been paying attention over the last few months, you might have noticed that we have awakened to years of neglect and we are taking action to elevate this space. It is therefore fortuitous that the team taking the lead in this regard, the Aesthetics Con Continuity Team, has ACT as its acronym. Consistent with our efforts, I am here to explain what the ACT team is doing, and perhaps more accurately, why we are making the changes you are seeing. So first, I should introduce the ACT team, all of whom stepped up to volunteer without being asked and who have worked very hard. Lauren Cantatori Causey, Elise Smith, Robin Carter, Hannah Kiley, and Arthur Smith. We have also had substantial contributions to the carpentry and painting from our spouses and other volunteers. It began with a very generous donation earmarked for art from Lynn Albright and Joanne Raskin, for which we are all very grateful. They were here earlier, but I guess they've left. And that generosity has spurred so much more. It includes an endowment fund grant and additional donations in cash and in kind. So the results of our makeover that you can see today came from a concerted effort of about 12 members, countless hours, and over $8,000 in investments. And our work is not done. Our efforts have been not just to beautify the physical space, but to create an ambiance to better represent us and meet our spiritual needs, a welcoming place of memory and hope, caring, inspiration, expression, activism, and gratitude. In writing this sermon, I found I can say far more on this subject than fits in 15 to 20 minutes. So consider this as a highlight reel, planting a seed for mindfulness about our church as part of our spiritual journey and consider it also as an invitation to dialogue about how we can do better. Because this is about mindfulness, awareness of our surroundings, I have loosely organized my thoughts by spiritual attributes. Some might engender controversy, so I have chosen st to start with the least controversial issue. In a room full of Unitarian Universalists, that is heresy. And this comes under the attributes of memory and inspiration. We want to lift up exemplary Unitarian Universalists, not only to honor their service and sacrifice, but to inspire the better angels of our own nature. For instance, let me introduce you to Michael Servetus, who was mentioned in last week's GA service. We claim him as a UU martyr. He was born in the early 1500s in Spain. He was brilliant. He was a polymath and studied everything, including science, law, astronomy, and medicine. He is credited with publishing the first accurate description of the body's pulmonary circulation. He was also a theologian, studying the Bible in its original languages. To his surprise, he found no mention of the Trinity in the Bible. When he was only about 22 years old, Servetus published De Trinitatis Erroribus, on the errors of the Trinity. This brought upon him the unwelcome attention of the Spanish Inquisition. So he changed his name and moved to France. 
continuing an illustrious career of scientific discoveries and teaching and heresy. He published Christianismi Restitutio, The Restoration of Christianity, which rejected the idea of predestination and other church teachings. The Roman Catholic authorities arrested him and imprisoned him with the intention of condemning him to death, but he escaped only to be arrested again. In October of 1553, after a trial during which even his sexuality was questioned, he was convicted of two counts, anti-Trinitarianism and opposing infant baptism. He was burned at the stake on a pyre of his own books. He was approximately 44 years old and had spent half his life openly challenging the, truth's church, the church's truth and dodging the Inquisition. The writings of Servetus influenced the beginnings of the Unitarian movement in Poland and Transylvania and fostered the early Unitarians in England. This is not just an interesting story, and I've only scratched the surface. We should remember Michael Servetus and his martyrdom. We should teach our children about it, and we have space in our hallways set aside to honor such people. But you do not have to die a martyr to deserve honor in our hallowed hallway. We claim heroes, too. Consider Martha and Wait Still Sharp. Their story is told in a book entitled Rescue and Flight and was made into a Ken Burns documentary called Defying the Nazis, the Sharps War. Acting as American Unitarian aid workers, the Sharps helped thousands of Jews, intellectuals, and children escape the Nazis in Southern Europe. It was very dangerous work and they had close calls but they lived long after the war. In recognition of the work they did to assist Jews, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority in Israel, honored the Sharps as, re as righteous among the nations in 2006, two of only five Americans to receive that distinction. We should remember the Sharps as they were acting as you use. We, claim their, we should claim them and their legacy. A church is a place of remembrance and hope. The ACT team has been inspired to dedicate a portion of the hallway to a periodically changing exhibit, honoring four to six of these UUs at a time. This is not only so that we can remember their sacrifices and good work, but so that our children will have examples of people like themselves who were free thinkers and had the courage of their convictions, contributing to the cause of love and justice in the world. It's about UU representation in our global history. While not quite as dramatic in history, we also have our own past. This church's congregation has been keeping the liberal tradition alive in Corpus Christi since about 1954. We plan to dedicate another portion of the hallway to remembering who and where we came from. There are group pictures, there were camping trips, there was a children's choir and plays, there was a time between selling the old church and building the new when we met at the Jewish Community Center. We have a rich history that might actually be inspiring. It should at least be amusing as we do have pictures of Glenn, Tess, and Sadie when they were children in our programs. We should honor our own past. We should look into the faces of those who took a tremendous leap of faith, giving generously and borrowing carefully to build and maintain this church for generations to come, local UUs. Some are still here, some are no longer with us on a regular basis, some have died, some have moved, some only stream our services. <laughs> but their contributions have been invaluable and they are missed. So let me pause here to note that the original loan we needed to build this facility after applying the money raised in the capital campaign was in the amount of $420,000. Because of the generosity of members of this congregation, past and present, we are now enjoying this facility with only about $76,000 left on the loan. The debt is currently held interest-free by members of this congregation and will be paid off in six more years. Usually only board members are concerned about the debt we carry, but I mention it because whether you love this facility or not, Owning it free and clear will free up money for many other good things we'd like to do. 
and thankfully we will be there in no time. So I find that I have transitioned from the church's facility's purpose of remembrance and inspiration to gratitude. Thanks to some at times belligerent foresight, we also have an endowment fund. It is made up primarily of former members' bequests and their wills, and only in the last few years grew to a level where, we, where it can continue growing for the future, while also providing grants for capital improvements and other current special projects. It has funded projection equipment, RE curriculum, AC replacement, which you will be very happy about, and the recent painting of the sanctuary. We have donor recognition plaques that will be placed in the vestibule where we enter the sanctuary. I wish they were up now. There's only so much time. I hope that you will take a moment to appreciate their gifts and to enter this sanctuary with a spirit of gratitude. We also wanted to feature our community action and service efforts. We have placed a new whiteboard in a prominent position at the front of the hallway where we hope to display pictures and explanations of our activism and community involvement. The idea is that this should be a rapidly changing exhibit and yet another inspiration this time to get involved, to make good on our reputation as a church of deeds, not creeds. But to be involved, you have to come through our welcoming space. We have sought to make the front door and foyer as open, calm, and welcoming as we can. We have moved the business center, all the bulletin boards, to an information hub around the corner in the hallway. There you will be able to find all the inspirational posters and informational flyers you need to understand who we mean to be, find upcoming events, and follow board business. There is even a community space for you to post your own notices if you need to buy or sell goods or services or promote some non-church related event. But in the foyer itself, we invite you in. You can sit now in chairs which are not accidental or isolated, but placed intentionally. You can put your cup of coffee down or your phone to visit with someone new or simply get your bearings. We hope it offers beautiful space where we've brought nature in. We have also selected art pieces that are designed to signal our love for diversity. If you are part of the LGBTQIA community, and are looking for a rainbow, we have a really cool rainbow splash art piece. If you are looking for cues regarding racial diversity, we have a work that features varying skin tones. And if you are trans, please know that we are working on a specific piece that will include the pink, blue, and white colors of that group. So let me pause here and answer the question that might be in some of your minds. Why not have big, more direct posters with words that say, we love, seek, or welcome diverse persons in sort of a U2C3 wants you approach? Our answer first is that such things remain on our corner sign and on the glass at the door. More can and likely will be located at the front of the hallway information hub where they are still prominent. But our more philosophical answer is that we cannot expect posters to do the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion for us. And we should be careful with our message not to cross the line from welcoming to targeting or tokenizing. I assume that we welcome new people who come to these doors because they seek a free-thinking liberal religion, a spiritual enterprise. While shelter from the slings and arrows of a conservative society may be an important part of the bargain, that is not our sole purpose. And over-the-top welcoming can turn into tokenism regardless of the numbers of different minority or marginalized group members we have. If we make people feel like they are welcomed because they are gay or trans or of color or of whatever demographic designation you choose, then are we welcoming their whole person or are we substituting their demographic for their value or purpose? The dangers of tokenism are readily explained in employment resources and I have adapted some here. When they feel tokenized, people may feel increased pressure and stress 
to act and perform in ways that improve the perception of their labeled group rather than as an expression of their own interests and talents. In working harder and performing to a higher representative standard, they may end up feeling personally undervalued and disillusioned. Such an environment can be detrimental to their psychological safety, causing feelings of insecurity around asking questions, participating in important conversations, and taking leadership positions in the mission of the church. So we don't want to cross that line from welcoming whole persons to targeting persons for their demographic. We should not assume that because we value diversity that all those who would diversify us want or need to be here. And we are certainly not the only church in town that is welcoming diversity. Even more important, as Eli preached about a month ago, diversity must be accompanied by inclusion. We cannot expect to, to place a flag at our door and be done. So the ACT team is saying, let's welcome every person who walks through the door as their full authentic self, assuming that they are here to be used with us and among us and not to represent a particular demographic. Let our message be that your whole authentic self includes your spiritual yearnings and not only that which makes you different from the norm. Toward that end, our signaling is more subtle and we have moved the name tags to the front door. Not only did that make room for the new information hub, but it will hopefully encourage our members to stop at the front door and perhaps greet new people. As writer and radical activist Max Eastman said, a smile is the universal welcome. <laughs> Moving on to expression. Those who write, dance, or sing have opportunities for expression in the performing arts with such things as our coffee house, the choir and the band are giving a sermon, or all three at the same time, and losing your voice in rehearsal. <clears throat> and yes, we have had interpretive dance at the pulpit. Left out of this opportun are opportunities for expression of those who create visual, visual art, painting and photography, for instance. So we have set aside a space for a rotating art exhibit to be used on a first come first serve basis for anyone who would like to share their inspiration and creativity with this congregation. While the details are still being worked out and the demand for our supply is not yet clear, we anticipate that each artist member will have somewhere between one to three months at a time to maintain their exhibit. Last, I want to address the worship function. What is it about our interior design that speaks to us about our spiritual denomination. We have stained glass. We have our chalice symbols. And as you saw this morning, we have consecrated a new chalice that is made from our own mesquite and will burn proudly as a beacon of our community of love and justice. But we can do more to add to the visual representation of our spirituality. We are currently in talks with aloe tile which is Ed and Cornelia Gates, who introduced themselves. We are trying to develop an art tile installation that would feature the symbols of the world religions and, because I know it just popped into your heads, including humanism, atheism, paganism, and others. Whether placed behind the pulpit, perhaps on the columns, or on the exhibit wall out in the foyer, it would lend gravitas to our space as home to broad-minded spiritual thinking. It would be an artistic, physical manifestation of our individual and collective search for truth and meaning beyond any single religious source. So that is probably more than I had time to discuss and less than I would have liked to cover. Our work began with a generous donation earmarked for art and it expanded into rethinking our image and how our sacred space speaks for us as a congregation. I am proud of the work we are doing. One member of the team said that the work we were doing was holy work, and I agree. And a friend paid us the highest compliment when she said, the church looks loved again. If you want to participate in the evolution of the building, we are looking for a few volunteers to clean the 17 foyer hallway doors and frames um, next Saturday, 
or the following Saturday so, so that they can also be painted. We are assembling a wish list for items we need but do not have resources to purchase. I hope that you will appreciate this church for all that it offers, including an intentional planned space that lifts up our best selves, our most hopeful, welcoming, creative, and spiritual selves. May it be so.